I could have said, going in the totally opposite direction, that Job's that despite Job's righteousness, his children could have been disobedient, you know, and Job's misfortunes could have, in part, been a vehicle for God's judgment upon those children, lest they take their father down in their unrighteousness. And this is the reason why I think that this is actually even a better assumption than my first one about them going to heaven. Because if we look at uh, chapter 1, verses 4 through 5, And his sons went and feasted in their houses, every one his day, and sent and called for their three sisters to eat and drink with them. And it was so, when the days of their feasting were gone about, that Job sent and sanctified them, and rose up early in the morning and offered burnt offerings according to the number of them all, for Job said, It may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus did Job continually. So, you know, that shows that maybe they were sinning. But the Bible is neither clear is clear neither in one way or the other about it. So, you know, it's it's all speculation. Okay, I want to confirm that the point being speculated here is that God may have decided to send Job's children to hell early in order to preserve Job's righteousness. Am I getting that correct? In fact, you made a claim that in the text of what you read in chapter 7 verse 9, uh, you were saying in your in what you read concerning the the Bible the the book of Job, excuse me, um, saying that there is no afterlife in what you read, your sub, your assertions actually destroyed you with one word, and that's Sheol. You see, in chapter 7, verse 9, you get to that part, you read this. As the cloud is consumed and vanisheth away, so is he that goeth down to the grave shall come up no more. The Hebrew word, I believe, that you use in that part was Sheol. So the King James Version translates Sheol in two ways. It translates it as either hell or the grave. Okay, But, here's the kicker. The word Sheol is the Hebrew word for the afterlife. It is not just, does not just mean hell, does not just mean the grave. It is actually the Hebrew word for the afterlife. Now, let me defend myself on this. Though there are several more robust articles that do not come from sources that are quite so controversial, I will, however, use the definition found in Wikipedia and supply you with uh, additional sources, and I'll have them down there in the doobly-doo. Okay. As you will see, they are from very different, widely diverse sources, but their descriptions all pretty much line up describing Sheol as the afterlife. Now, according to Wikipedia, the, um, the definition of Sheol is the earliest conception of the afterlife in Jewish scriptures. It is a place of darkness to which all dead go regardless of the moral choices made in life and where they are removed from the light of God. In the Tanakh, of which the book of Job is part, depending on which version you're looking at, Sheol is the common def destination of both the righteous and the unrighteous flesh as recounted in Ecclesiastes and Job. Now, other Old Testament books mention Sheol as well, okay? such as Psalms, where David writes in Psalm 139, 8, If I ascend into heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, and the King James Version translated, translates it rather incorrectly as hell, behold, you are there. It seems that what's been done here is jumping on the word afterlife in the Wikipedia article for Sheol and then making all kinds of assumptions about Sheol based upon later concepts of life after death and resurrection. To start, I'm going to read from a source which you actually cited regarding Sheol and see how it matches up regarding later doctrine of resurrection. For example, Sheol is a place where, once there, one cannot return to the realm of the living and is forgotten. 
And this actually quotes Job 7.9, which you read back for me. This link also says, The Hebrew term Sheol appears to be a place where dead people, both believers and non-believers, went to. It is a metaphorical way, like a poetic device, of describing what happens to people when they died. It was not a term to describe the shadowy region of the netherworld, or a temporary place the dead go to before judgment. Does that sound like the idea of life after death, which you seem to be characterizing Sheol as? I'd also like to cite some sources which affirm my reading of chapter 7 and 14 of Job. Uh, the first is the New Oxford Annotated Bible. Uh, this is in the annotations listed on pages 739 and 740 regarding verses 7 through 12 of chapter 14. The hopes of a tree and of humankind are contrasted. A tree that is cut down can hope for new life. For humans there is none until the heavens are no more, i.e. never. If only Sheol, the underworld, could be not a final resting place without an exit, but a temporary hiding place from God's scrutiny and anger. I'd also like to cite the New Jerusalem Bible. Uh, this is on page 764 of this particular Bible. Uh, this is the note regarding Job chapter 7, verse 9. The author expresses the current view here and in 1021, 14, 7 through 22, 16, 22, see 2 Samuel 12, 23, Psalm 88, 10, etc., that return from Sheol is impossible. This is how Job 10, 21 reads in the New Jerusalem Bible. The days of my life are few enough. Turn your eyes away. Leave me a little joy before I go to the place of no return to the land of darkness and shadow dark as death, where dimness and disorder hold sway, and light itself is like dead of night. The notes in the New Jerusalem Bible regarding chapter 14, verse 12, on page 773, read as follows. The eschatological imagery, by indefinitely postponing the possibility of awakening, is here used to stress the fact that human beings disappear without hope of return. The expectation of a resurrection at the end of time is apparently not yet within the scope of the author. I'd also like to read chapter 16, verses 20 through 22, since verse 22 was cited in the notes for chapter 7, verse 9. Interpreter of my thoughts there with God, before whom flow my tears, let my anguish plead the cause of a man at grips with God, just as a man might defend his fellow. For the years of my life are numbered, and I am leaving by the road of no return. I'd like to cite the Jewish Study Bible next. The notes for Job chapter 7 verse 9 are found on page 1514, which says, Sheol is the underworld where everyone goes after death. Only in post-biblical thought did a differentiated idea of heaven and hell develop. So, let's not pretend that the New Testament is talking about the same thing. And the article cited regarding Olam Haba is not talking about the same thing either. Although I can understand how easily that breadcrumb trail can be created when selectively quoting a Wikipedia article. The notes regarding chapter 14 are found on page 1523, which says, regarding verses 7 through 12, Job is full of ironies. Picking up on the image of the withering flower of verse 2, Job insists that trees are better off than people, since they renew themselves while human death cannot be reversed. Then regarding verses 13 through 14, the notion of an afterlife, the resurrection of the dead, or a world to come where people are rewarded or punished for their deeds in this world, had not yet developed at the time that Job was written. He has thus, in general, 
no recourse to these ideas or beliefs in his argument, although there may be the seeds of this idea in verse 14. Here's another thing. Even if there were no mention of Sheol in the book of Job, I'm sorry, Violent Graceful, but you'd be hard pressed to explain how the majority of Jews, both modern and ancient, believe that there is an afterlife despite what you claim the book of Job said. You have to be careful about how you use scripture. Okay. And you have to understand the underlying meanings of it. So, you know, the, and these were well over a thousand years after Job was written. So no Christians, of course, were going to agree that any scripture refutes an afterlife. N.T. Wright, definitely not an unbeliever, and certainly not a liberal or a skeptic either. So I'm going to be reading from pages 97 to 99 of The Resurrection of the Son of God. The undiscovered country from whose born no traveler returns. Thus Shakespeare's Hamlet musing on death, all the more remarkably in a play written from within Christendom. But the sentiment is an accurate description of the regular Old Testament belief about the fate of the dead. Death is a one-way street on which those behind can follow, but those ahead cannot turn back. Humans are here today, gone tomorrow, and seen no more. The book of Job contains the most emphatic statements on the subject. He then quotes from Job chapter 14, and he ends at verse 14, which he translates, Oh, that you would hide me in Sheol, that you would conceal me until your wrath is past, that you would appoint me a set time and remember me. If mortals die, will they live again? The last question clearly expects the answer, no, which is reinforced elsewhere in Job and echoed in, among other places, Jeremiah. He cites Jeremiah 51, 39, and 57. Within the book, part of the point is Job's insistence that Yahweh must give judgment in his favor during this life. The dead have no future, so God's judgment must take place here and now. Continuing, Ecclesiastes 2 insists that death is the end and there is no return. Though nobody can be sure what precisely happens at death, as far as we can tell, humans are in this respect no different from beasts. He then cites Ecclesiastes 3, 19-21, which ends, Who knows whether the human spirit, or breath, ruach, goes upward and the spirit of animals goes downward to the earth. In the notes, he explains, The meaning of the final rhetorical question seems to be that the same breath of life, God's breath, is in the nostrils of both humans and beasts, not that there is a specific theory about human spirits going to a place of blessedness. And even if there was such a theory, this verse would be challenging it with straightforward agnosticism. He continues, No, to die is to be forgotten for good. Death means that the body returns to the dust, and the breath to God who gave it meaning not that an immortal part of the person goes to live with God, but that the God who breathed life's breath into human nostrils in the first place will simply withdraw it into his own possession. And though I know that this might not have been your point, okay, I just want it to be known that Job's words were not out of malevolence or spite. Okay, they were born of confusion and grief, neither of which are sins. This may be a matter of opinion, but it seems to me that the following may have been spoken out of a bit of spite by Job. This is from chapter 9, verses 14 through 24. How then can I answer him, or choose my arguments against him? Though I were in the right, I could not speak out, but I would plead for mercy with my judge. If I summoned him and he responded, I do not believe he would lend me his ear, for he crushes me for a hair. He wounds me much, 
for no cause. He does not let me catch my breath, but sates me with bitterness. If a trial of strength, he is the strong one. If a trial in court, who will summon him for me? Though I were innocent, my mouth would condemn me. Though I were blameless, he would prove me crooked. I am blameless. I am distraught. I am sick of life. It is all one. Therefore, I say, he destroys the blameless and the guilty. When suddenly a scourge brings death, he mocks as the innocent fail. The earth is handed over to the wicked one. He covers the eyes of its judges. If it is not he, then who? Okay, what you don't understand is that God's role in this is an indirect one. Satan did indeed bring those calamities on Job, as chapter 1 says, but only by God's permission. Interesting thing how, how, how Satan said, put forth thine hand now and touch all that he hath and he will curse thee to thy face. But then God turned around and said, all that he has is yours. In other words, he's given the devil leave to do this. What I'm trying to say is that though God is indeed bringing calamity upon Job, it's, this is not a direct delivery system. Okay, This is indirect and brought about by permission of God. In fact, no fortune, and I'm talking about in, in just in, in, a, in, in just in our daily lives, no fortune or misfortune comes to us unless God wills it. And as I said in my first video, it's always for a reason. And that's a fact that the story of Job proves. This is chapter 2, verse 3. Yahweh said to the adversary, Have you noticed my servant Job? There is no one like him on earth, a blameless and upright man who fears God and shuns evil. He still keeps his integrity. So you have incited me against him to destroy him for no good reason. This would be literally translated as for nothing or for naught. It's deliberately paralleling chapter 1 verse 9 in which the adversary asks Yahweh, does Job not have good reason to fear God? Or does Job fear God for nothing or for naught? Additionally, verse 16 of chapter 1 says, God's fire fell from heaven, took hold of the sheep and the boys, and burned them up. Whose fire? Was it Satan's fire? Yahweh already took responsibility for Job's misfortunes in chapter 2, verse 3. Yahweh was incited by Satan to destroy Job. God was destroying Job, not Satan, and he was doing it for no reason. I think that out of the book of Job, the book of Job shows specifically that God is not capricious, he doesn't, and he doesn't make mistakes. In fact, I think that someone who doubts God's power in his or her life would do well to read the book of Job, especially chapters 38 to 41, in order to gain good perspective on themselves and God. 